Shalom and a blessed day to all of you and welcome to another episode of the epistle hallelujah and so let's turn to again we are in the book of first corinthians and let's turn to first corinthians in chapter 11 and from verse 23 to verse 34 and i believe many of you are familiar with this passage because most of the time the pastor in the churches would initiate the lord's communion by the reading of this passage but today let us come before the lord's table and ask the lord to give us a greater in-depth and a precise understanding of what this passage or the context here is all about so let's read first the word of god first corinthians chapter 11 verse 23 onwards and paul say for i received from the lord that which i also deliver to you that the lord jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me in the same manner he also took the cup after supper and saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the lord's death till he comes and therefore whoever eats this bread or drink this cup of the lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the lord <clears throat> And therefore whoever eats this bread i'm uh, sorry uh, but let a man verse 28 but let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup for he who eats and drink in an unworthy manner eats and drink judgment to himself not discerning the lord's body underline that we're going to come back to that in a short while and for this reason many are weak and sick among you and many sleep for if we would judge ourselves we would not be judged but when we are judged we are chastened by the lord that we may not be condemned with the world therefore my brethren when you come together to eat wait for one another but if anyone is hungry let him eat at home lest you come together for judgment and the rest i will set in order when i come so let's expound on the verses here and let us dive into the context so that we understand what was apostle paul trying to portray to the church in corinth here and to every church today he say that on the night that's of course we know was the last supper that christ had with his disciples that the lord took bread and he gave thanks for the bread in what we call the eucharist and he broke the bread and he told the disciples said take it this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me now the jewish people understood it very well because it was taught in rabbinical teachings that the priests would take bread every sabbath the 12 loaf of bread set on the table of showbread and they would break it and it symbolized oneness with God and oneness with one another. That's the unity element in the breaking of the bread. And that's why when we break bread, we are actually proclaiming that we are one with the Lord and we are one with each other in the body of Christ. Hallelujah. 
In fact, the breaking of bread itself defeat every work of darkness, every work of division, and every work of disagreement. Because there is a unity element in the breaking of the bread of the Lord's body. Now we also know that by His stripes we are healed, meaning that in the breaking of the bread, we are able to receive healing for our body and in fact it goes beyond that for our mind for our our mental emotional and physical ailments hallelujah and it bring wholeness and completeness to us spirit soul and body and then in verse 25 he say that this cup is the new covenant in my blood now every Jewish hearers or the audience of that day would understood that this mean this mean that now Jesus is initiating a new covenant because they knew that it takes blood or it requires the substitute of animals blood to initiate covenants so Jesus is saying, now as you drink of this new wine, this wine set before the table, he said, this is my blood because I'm going to spill my blood. In fact, in, in a matter of a few hours time, I'm going to spill my blood. And this is going to be a new covenant that I'm going to initiate with you here and after. And this, he said, do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And verse 26 again he says that as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup. Now, how many times are we required to take the communion? Jesus didn't give us a, a precedence that say you must take it once a week or once a month. He said as often as you take it, it means you can do it every day or what if you do it two times a day three times a day well there is no set rules that say how many times are you allowed to take the lord's body and drink of his cup all he says as often as you do it make sure that you proclaim the lord's death now what do we mean by proclaiming the lord's death it means that we acknowledge His finished work on the cross. It's as simple as that, but it's as profound as it could go. We acknowledge what Jesus has done for us, what He has accomplished for us. That's what it means to proclaim the Lord's death. Now, in the early century, when the, when the believers break bread and they drink of the cup, they will say, Jesus has done this for us. He has forgiven us of our sins, our iniquities. That's proclaiming the Lord's death. Jesus has healed us of our diseases, our sickness. That is part of proclaiming the Lord's death. Jesus has restored us to wholeness and completeness and oneness and has given us a sound mind. That's proclaiming the Lord's death. Because we are acknowledging what He has done. Hallelujah. Then, in verse 27, it says, Whoever eats this bread or drink this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. Now, this is where many times if we misinterpret these words, we condemn ourselves in such a way we, bring, we become guilty because we will examine ourselves and say, Oh, I did something wrong before I came to church this morning. Oh, I had a, disagree I had a disagreement with someone last night. And, and then it makes us feel guilty or we come with a guilty conscience when we come to these words and say, Oh, maybe I'm not worthy to partake of the Lord's body. Now, this is not what it means. Let me put it this way. None of us is worthy of His grace. While we were still sinners, He died for us. 
The Bible says that all of us fall short of His glory. And we are all unworthy sinners, but Christ deemed us worthy to come and died for us to give us salvation and an eternal relationship with Him. So when would you become worthy? It's by accepting His finished work. Do you get that? It's by acknowledging His finished work and applying the grace of what He has done on the cross that His blood cleanses us. It's not by our own self-righteous acts. It's not by living a life that is full of charitable good deeds that make us worthy. Otherwise, we would just fall into the same category as the rest of all the other religion who excel in doing good works. So it's not good works, it's not our merits. It is His grace that makes us worthy. So what does it mean here in verse 27? It says that when we eat of His bread and drink of His cup in an unworthy manner, we'll be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. And verse 28, he says, But let a man examine himself. Okay, further, further condemnation again. Oh, I got to examine myself. What if I have said a lie or done something wrong or I have a wrong attitude? Does it mean that it, it forbids me to take the communion? It says, Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And he says, For verse 29, this is the answer. To the context here. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, he says, eats and drinks judgment. Oh, this is serious stuff here. If you drink it in an unworthy manner, that's judgment. But he says when he was 29, that's the answer there. Not discerning the Lord's body. That's the answer. It's not about discerning your own body, what you have done with your body. It's not discerning what you have spoken, what you have heard, how you have felt towards someone or your attitude. Because we know that the blood of Jesus takes care of that when we confess our sin and we allow Him to cleanse us and we seek Him for forgiveness. His blood is a done deal. It washes us and it cleanses us every time we acknowledge our wrongs he makes our wrongs and he turn it into righteousness by the cleansing power of the blood of jesus so verse 29 says not discerning the lord's body we take the cup or we partake of his body and the cup in an unworthy manner when we do not respect what he has done for us on the cross that's what it means not discerning the lord's body when we do not acknowledge that what he has done is enough and is complete you get that when we do not understand that there is healing power in his sacrifice on the cross in his brokenness by his stripes we are healed when we does not when we do not sorry acknowledge what Jesus Christ has accomplished we are taking his body in an unworthy manner that, that's why verse 29 says not discerning the lord's body that's the answer and what is the lord's body as healing there's forgiveness there's unity there's oneness there's completeness there's restoration there's cleansing that's everything. Hallelujah. From forgiveness to restoration in the Lord's body. And if we don't discern that and we take off his cup and his body, we are taking it in an unworthy manner. And then Paul goes on to say in verse 30, For this reason, many are weak and sick and many are sleeping. 
are asleep or many are slumbering spiritually because they don't understand the covenantal virtues or the covenantal attributes of the Lord's communion. And there are some who partake of it as though it's some sacred ritual or some religious traditions or, or some Sunday service rites. <laughs> rites as in R-I-T-E-S. And they fail to acknowledge that there is power, there's an invocation of covenantal virtues that flows from the partaking of his body and his blood. And when they fail to understand all these, you are not discerning the Lord's body. Therefore, you are taking it in an unworthy manner, unworthy of what Jesus has done for you. It's not about what you did in your body. It is what the Lord's body has accomplished for you and I. Do you get that? Then he says in verse 31, here Paul goes on to explain further. He says, If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. Judging ourselves in what manner here? Let's look on. Let's look on, on the next verse here. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. And I like that. When we do judge ourselves in the, in the word, when we do discern our attitude, our motive and our understanding and our honoring of what Jesus has done, then we will not be condemned. Hallelujah. Praise God for that. Now, verse 33 gives us again another further answer to the context. Therefore, my brethren, he says, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Oh. Verse 34. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. You see that? What is the judgment here in the context? It's not about just examining your own self, but it's about examining what Jesus has done for us. And that partaking of the bread entails unity. Or in another word, it entails everyone to come together in accordance and to take of it at the same time in holy reverence of what Jesus has accomplished. The Lord's body is not to be taken lightly in the aspect that is not to be treated as an ordinary dinner. Because in the context of the early church, when they partake of the Lord's body, it is part of their meal. That's why Paul says, if you are really hungry, you go back home and eat first your dinner because when you come and partake of the Lord's body, you are to wait for everyone to be given or to be distributed that portion of the bread and everyone will come in that unity and in accordance to take of it. And there are some during those days who are hungry and when they receive their portion straight away they would eat it and they were not they were not waiting for others to come together where everyone would get a portion and then there will be also songs of hymns and prayers being offered to the Lord before they partake of the body. And that's why Paul admonished them. They take it in an unworthy manner because they treated the Lord's body like an ordinary dinner, like an ordinary meal. Do you get that? That's the answer there. That's why it says, if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. You see verse 34 there. And the rest I will set in order when I come. So again, verse 33, verse 34. When you come together to eat, wait for one another. Wait for one another. There's a holy reverence in the partaking, in the unity of the body. That's the context here. Hallelujah. And so with these 
I pray that you understand that every time we partake of the Lord's body, let us have the same mind as the early disciples, that they understood it perfectly well, that they are discerning the Lord's body, what Jesus has accomplished. Hallelujah. That we examine His finished work through the virtues of His brokenness on the cross, that there is healing, there's restoration, there is a power that's being initiated when we partake of the Lord's body. And when you don't discern this, many are sick, many are weak, many are asleep. Because you are not able to appropriate the power of His communion in your life. That's why you are weak and you are sick. Or when you do his or when you take his communion as part of a traditional ritual, there is no power in tradition. Hallelujah. So every time you come to the Lord's body, remember this. You are partaking of the virtues of his covenant. You are partaking of the attributes. Of his goodness and what he has accomplished for you and I on the cross. And so may the Lord bless you with this passage. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Amen.